Hi everyone. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thanks for coming. It's not a full cinema, which disappoints me a bit, but I'm really glad you guys are here. And uh, my name is Bill Masoulis, and I, together with Chris Luskri, uh, we curate. This series of screenings called Unknown Pleasures, um, Australian Independent Cinema. Uh, we always try to highlight um, uh, retrospective films, uh, people, uh, contemporary ones that uh, from people who are not very well known. Um, uh, so, yeah, thanks for coming. Uh, thanks to the cinema. Thanks, Josh and, and Gus Berger, um, who runs the place together with uh, Lou. Thanks for them allowing us to put these kind of screenings on. Uh, and I'd also like to thank the traditional owners of this land for allowing us to live, work and play here after 250 years of abuse against them, continuing abuse. Uh, so my respects to the Wurundjeri elders and my love and solidarity with all Indigenous people. Uh, so yeah, uh, these are our artists tonight and uh, I first saw this film here, now I feel like a, an academic, uh, so <laughs> there only guys. <laughs> this is the film I first saw three years ago and it blew me away and then I delved into their work a little bit and uh, discovered a rich history uh, of work and ideas there. Um, so I, I won't say anything more myself, uh, I really love their work. Uh, at the end, we'll have a Q&A uh, moderated by Anna Zenis, um, who teaches at VCA at the moment, and she's taught at La Trobe uh, Cinema Studies for uh, quite a few years before that. And uh, so we'll just do a quick intro. So we've basically got... It, it's a short program, about an hour long, and it's in two halves, part one and part two. And part one uh, will be introduced by Richard and part two by Karen. And then, yeah, we'll have the Q&A at the end. So um, I, I think you'll really enjoy the films. They're really dazzling and delightful and, and um, yeah, yeah, whatever you want to say. <laughs> so Richard James Allen, if you want to introduce this first uh, round. <laughs> Well, look, thank you so much, Bill. I also want to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people and uh, send my apologies for, on behalf of our nation for stuffing up recently. Um, hopefully we'll do better next time. Um, it's a real honour to screen here and we're really pleased that you're here. Um, we've been, Karen Perlman, my partner, and I have been making films for many years. Um, we started out as live performers. Um, and we called our works a cinematic blend of text and dance action and then actually became cinema. Um, but it's a real honour and a very unusual privilege to be able to look back at work and see work um, that, you know, had a moment before but now can be seen in another way by being seen together. Um, so I'm not going to say too much about the details of the program, but I just want to say one word which is expansion, expansion. Um, I think that's the theme that I would like to ex um, implant for the first part, which is called Sky Entanglements. Um, expansion of dance uh, into, uh, which is an ephemeral form, into a medium that is less ephemeral. Expansion of what the human body can do um, to going beyond itself, an expansion of cinema um, beyond traditional tools into other technologies, and an expansion of spirit, um, a expansion of our self-definition of who we are, who we think we are, into perhaps we can be more than we think. I think that's a really important theme. Uh, I think it's a positive theme that we have huge potential. Thank you. So part two, Karen, if you want to come up and say a few words, Karen Perlman. Uh, we should also say maybe that in the audience tonight we have Samuel Lucas Allen, who's the, uh, the son. Um, yeah, and he got a, he's get, been getting a couple of credits now in the last couple of films. Yeah. 
That's actually Sam on the physical TV logo. He's pulling this way, and Richard and I are in the middle, and then Sam's younger sibling, Jazz, is pulling this way. <laughs> and that's what's going on in the logo, and oh my goodness, that was kind of a wild documentary biography of my marriage. Um, I don't know if I should see a counselor or what, but you know, it's all... <laughs> Um, so my function, my key function at this moment is to try to uh, cleanse the palate a little bit. So it's, you know, and now for something completely different. And um, Richard spoke a lot about expansion in, in his introduction to those rather expansive films. Um, and so I thought I might just say a few words about contraction or editing, which is um, my thing. Uh, you know, editors give things structure and rhythm, and uh, what happened in my life was that I came out of a long time, a complete identity as a dancer, and wondered what I was going to do with all those years of making things move around. And what I landed on was film editing. And so there I was doing film editing at a AFTRS, and um, I did something kind of embarrassing at the time, which was I won the Screen Studies Prize and uh, was kind of ostracized by my peers for that. But I ended up um, going on and doing a PhD and helping in teaching it after almost immediately and eventually becoming the head of Screen Studies there where I uh, helped the students to see what the connections are between ideas, theories, histories, and so forth and their practice. Um, in that time, it was my delight to be able to frequently, once a year or so, introduce the great film Man with a Movie Camera. Um, but as I sort of learned more and more about this film, I would, I would kind of try to, you know, say, make this little joke to the students, like, you know, what's really extraordinary about this film is the editing, you know, the way that it's put together, the way it's given structure and flow. Shouldn't it be called Woman with an Editing Bench? Uh -huh. Well, then I find out that the woman who is in Man with the Movie Camera is the wife, the lifelong collaborator, and the editor of Ziga Vertov, the director of Man with the Movie Camera. And I think, no, this is not a joke. And this takes me, you know, on a left turn into a deep study of Soviet montage and um, a kind of development of my whole understanding of the art of editing as a choreographic art, and one that is about making meaning from movement. And um, out of that, I move on to Macquarie University, where I'm blessed to have my filmmaking recognized as research, and I start to make these three films that you're about to see. We're calling it an Editor's Anthology, and it's three films, three short films about Soviet women editors, which I hope you will enjoy. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Richard, uh, for a remarkable kind of body of work. Um, let me say these are multi-talented, creative people. Richard, Ooh. poet, novelist, dancer, writer, choreographer. I don't, I don't even know, like, you know, sort of where to, to sort of end. Karen, editor, dancer, writer, both academic, choreographer. Uh, you know, sort of um, both educators, um, bringing all this creativity to their uh, academic sort of teaching as well. So uh, remarkable. And I think we can see, yes, <laughs> thank you for, for all of this. Um, and I think we can see the multidisciplinarity um, of creative practice um, in the films, um, certainly. Um, I don't know where to start. Maybe um, I thought, what is it like? I, and I also want to thank Bill for curating mm. this kind of selection because let me, let me add, and I'm sure you can have a sense of this, this is only like a, a part of a very much larger body of work. Um, and if you have a look at physical TV, you'll have some sense of like how much work you've been doing over quite a long period of time. Uh, and continuing to work and imagining new projects, I mean, let me say. Um, but what was it like to see these beautifully curated um, selection of films tonight? Because it is a retrospective. Mm. 
<laughs> oh, and Aaron, cut to you guys. <laughs> um, yeah, you say something. It was kinesthetically unnerving. <laughs> I, you know, these are my memories. These are this is our photo album, our family photo album. As you say, there are other films, and there's a whole series of films that's actually called the Physical Family series. It starts. We start making them at about the same time, and. Uh, with, you know that's the whole life with the kids. They're they're in all of those films, and I just you know I'm I'm so present whenever I'm, whenever I see one of those films, I'm present in the moment of making it. So um, yeah, so it's kind of physically exhausting for me to go through all of those moments and memories again. Very interesting though. Well, yeah. Look, I mean, I really appreciate. Thank you so much, Bill. It's an amazing opportunity. Um, and we've talked for a while about, oh, one day maybe we could play these films together. Um, with the trilogy, we can obviously see the last three films. Um, they fit together in a really beautiful way, moving from a sort of period drama to a documentary to a hybrid documentary, which, and, and through them there's a sort of movement themes and then linking ideas, style and then music by Caitlin. So, there's a kind of a natural flow to that, though we haven't re we've had it in mind, but we haven't really had a chance to do it very much. And then the other ones, um, it's just been a kind of idea in the back of our minds that maybe somehow over a period of almost 20 years we made some films that somehow tell a, a long story, but we've never seen them together. So, you know, that was just this opportunity and this discussion. So, um, yeah, it's quite a trip, I must say. For me, it's quite a trip. I'm like... Yeah, right. kind of exhausting, but 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 fascinating and strange. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting because looking at them to me, I was actually putting them together as as a sequence, a chronology of sorts, um, and seeing you know sort of a narrative, which of mm. course will be different every time you pick a different kind of set of films. Um, but I thought the um, to begin with the dance films were very much about exploring what is possible in a dance film, mm. and like watching the selection. Um, you know, it was like the dancer was pushing the form and new forms, new technologies came along and the dancer was kind of trying to, uh, you know, sort of deal with those forms and, and push against them in some ways. Um, and it was like you were trying to find what dance film is in, mm -hmm. in the films that I, I was kind of seeing here today. I, I love that, trying to find what dance film is. I think that's, um, yeah, I think that, uh, as Bill said before, you know, they're, they're um, about form and form in dance and form in film. And um, we were really interested in this idea that, um, that if you can, you, it's not just documenting a form, but it is, it, it's sort of seeing how it can function in this new space. So how can dance function in this new space? And... And then all these, you know, this was a moment when technology was exciting, not as oppressive as it is today. Some of these kind of ideas that, oh, maybe we could discover really exciting things through technology. And so when some of these um, opportunities came up to work with, uh, you know, animation in Rubber Man, or even the very traditional one at the beginning is still with the cutouts, it's really kind of fascinating. And then Rubber Man, the sort of animation and the cartoons and and um, uh, then the Second Life animation, and then, and then the interactive one with uh, Monk Reload is actually an interactive installation. So we were, we were really fascinated by, by expanding the possibilities of both media and seeing how together they could create this sense of expansion and possibility, um, both formally and, as I said before, in a kind of, you know, they have these sort of spiritual ideas underneath them as well. So, you know, Rubber Man is a documentary. <laughs> I always felt that it was, and looking at them all together, I think, oh no, it's all a documentary. <laughs> but um, at the first one, A Dancer Drops Out of the Sky, was made the year after Effects was invented. So I was still in film school, and, and um, you know, this technology came along and uh, had an opportunity to play with it. And so I think that's really pretty... Uh, apt and accurate and rubber man was made maybe a year or two later after effects could do a lot more already and 
you know, on we went through all those different films. And yeah, we're exploring green screen, we're exploring Second Life, the interactive technology. There's definitely that sweep through of the technology. And I mean, I wonder though if the if the dancers pushing the technology or the, or vice versa or both. It feels like it's going both ways. Interesting now. question. Yeah. Um, and similarly with the um, you know editing um, trilogy. Um, as you know, sort of um, you know, sort of Richard already kind of described. There's there's a development through the films, um, and you know, I, in fact, I actually went looking. Was there really a Boris? Um, you know, sort of uh, back back in you know the time, and there was a Boris who was head of the um, you know film school. The film, yeah, the film exactly. There was, yes, there was, was a really Boris, awesome. and yeah. you know, something that was Marcus um, Graham, fantastic actor, and you know. Boris is sort of the bad guy, but just a little aside, he was under pressure. So we have to have compassion for people under pressure. He was actually killed by Stalin a year later. Oh, wow. Yeah. But like, so that starts off as, uh, and I was kind of, I, I immersed myself. You're really animated, you know, sort of Elizaveta Il 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 Svilova, uh, Elizaveta Svilova, and yeah. sort of Esther Schulv and yeah. Lilia. Lilia yeah, Breck, yeah. you really kind of animated them for me. But it was interesting to see, as as you were kind of saying, Richard, that the first one begins as like a biopic and is dramatic, even though there's subjectivity in kind of the storytelling. And the second one becomes sort of an archival piece, and the third one is something else. So <laughs> maybe maybe you want to take us through that something kind of trajectory. Yeah. Well, so I mean, to me, it's a it's a trajectory for me personally of confidence. And confidence in form and learning my learning craft and learning what could happen. Um, what I knew I wanted to do was to start telling these women's stories in the using the, in, the innovations for which they were known or for which they should be known. Um, and I, I, you know, I look at women with an ending bench and all I see is the mistakes I made. Oh. <laughs> but but I, I, I don't see any. Yeah, oh, good. <laughs> and they just you know thing, things I would do, would potentially do differently. But um, it was it was the form I felt that I could try to um, give that character some voice through. I mean, the one thing that we know about these women editors is that they really are invisibilized in part by the idea that editing is invisible and in part by the fact that they were, you know, really subjugated to their to their husbands and history has subjugated them to their husbands in that way uh, in its knowledge of them. Um, so that was a form I, at that time that I wanted to, you know, I felt that maybe that was the way to tell a story. In a funny way, after the fact, it's kind of like, whoop, no, that's not the way to tell a story. I need to go this way. And, and that's when I started working with Remix, so it's all 100% archive, that film, and all, even the music is archived, so we had the music editor take the score from Woman with an Editing Bench and remix it for After the Facts. <laughs> we had very little money for that film. So it's, it's, it's you might say it's a straight-up documentary. It's a straight-up archive-based documentary, and I voice over and tell the story. And then I kind of get to, I want to make a film about women, and I'm just increasing my confidence and I think, okay, well, what's actually interesting about after the facts? You know, maybe it's the voiceover. It's, you know, the telling of the story and the work that we did with sound that really makes it. So that's where I started with I Want to Make a Film About Women. But also I had a lot more access to archives. And I felt like, okay, I can play. <laughs> I can mash this up. I can go go out there with these things and um there's so much happening i mean yeah. eisenstein right. Fram, <laughs> uh, you know sort of vert off you know right. kind of coming back you know um the yeah. dancers the dancing yeah. kind of comes here yeah. um in a way that it, it wasn't so much in the other two well look i mean so so in, in part my confidence was increasing because the first two won some awards and got some play and got some interest around the world from you know, people who started to be interested in these stories. Um, I got a grant and we went to Moscow and that was wild. Um, How did that change, like accessing uh, the archives or what were the archives in? in okay, so there were, there, was, there were three different archives that we visited. Um, 
One was Gos Goskino, which is a film archive. So all the archives actual films, and I got to go in there, and they, I, you know, it was a two and a half hour ride in an Uber out of out of Moscow. <laughs> You know, it, it was kind of terrifying. I'm just doing in this forest. And, you know, fortunately, my Uber driver, who had doesn't speak any English, <laughs> decides to just take a nap for the day. He'd been working all night. He slept all day in his car, and he was still there when I got out of the archive. Because I don't know what I would have done, how I would have gotten anybody there. But th so that's the film archive, and I got to actually see and take um, make selections from the archive from, from, from that one. Um, the uh the other one that we went to was like a kind of it's called a documentary archive but it's documents of the history so we saw a lot of like I, I spent the whole day looking at photos of soviet kitchens <laughs> richard got bored <laughs> he walked down the hallway and introduced himself to the director of the archive and got her to start collecting our films and he was like ah, not looking at any more kitchens and off he went um and then um uh, woman woman women a woman with an editing bench is in that archive uh, yes, it is. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Richard has reseeded. I, I did kind of think that there were sort of creative spaces that sort of ran through the film. So Richard yeah. sort of sitting down in that kind of creative space and a couple of those films reminded me of the kitchen. Yeah. You know, so yeah. Lots yeah. of creative lots spaces. Of creative. I mean, I guess what we, what we really learned in Moscow, and there was one more archive that we went to, which was actually had Esper Schultz papers. But, you know, that's well, that was the one that's guarded by, you know, glass doors and men with machine guns. And you oh saw it. <laughs> the whole thing was really kind of, wild but anyway we learned a lot one of the, i'd say one of the really big things that influenced me was we went to a lot of these museums that were um they were what are they called apartment museums apartment museums, apartment yeah. museums. so stanislavski has one and Meyerhold has one and eisenstein no longer has one which is really disturbing but um there were none for any women right and th this whole domestic sphere that the women are keepers of was so important in this Soviet montage movement because they really did, they really did invent filmmaking gear with kitchen implements. And they really did all this stuff in the kitchen. So I guess I want to make a film about women is kind of inspired. It's like a museum. It's like a living museum for those women for trying to get under the skin of the interactions that they might have had and the way they might have worked together to actually create their films. You talk um, somewhere about, um, you know, embodying their kind of editing processes and I wondered how you did that. Because you said something about, I think you were just looking at films and mm -hmm. I, I'm not quite sure what that involves. <laughs> Well, Sam might have some comment on this. I certainly remember my children like going to bed hungry because I was so involved in editing. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just meant just <laughs> but you, editing is a very uh, immersive process, and you really do become um, it, it, the, the the way I've sort of theorized it is that what the editor is doing is mirroring or embodying in simulation the movement that they see on the screen, and this is. You know, this is theory that goes across ideas about neurology and ideas about how we understand films and so forth. But for an editor, it's very much about embodying the rhythms of what they see and shaping those rhythms. And so when an editor says that the way they work is intuitive or it feels right, that's actually what they mean. It's actually an embodied uh alignment or synchronization with the material that you're seeing to the point and if it's not quite working it just doesn't feel right you go back and you try it again and you go forward and you know it's it's about getting those rhythms to kind of settle into the film's body and your body okay. do we have some questions maybe uh yeah i'll, I'll kick it off um yeah, yeah just on what just on what you were saying there about um, editing, because I, I, I myself as a filmmaker really love editing, you know, and sometimes it's that thing about the, the one frame out, you know, like you're always like thinking, yeah, okay, it's you're pushing it a bit, one more frame and then one more and then that's the right one. You kind of know. Um, 
I don't know. I, I think a kind of question, uh, maybe the audience doesn't know, but yeah, you guys were, um, you know, dancers and solely dancers in, in New York um, in the 80s and from the early 80s when you were 20 odd. Um, and at some point, uh, can you talk a little bit about when the point happened when you wanted to capture that on maybe video it was at the time, was it? I think I've seen one from the late 80s or somewhere, a video that's online somewhere. What, uh, so you actually, um, so yeah, you both wanted to do that, to capture on film, on video? Um, well, I'll start with that. I, um, one of my first ever films that I saw as a kid when I was living in Japan was Showboat. And I just fell in love with musicals and movement in film. And I always wanted to make that. Even when, even when we were doing live work, I always thought, I always saw myself going towards film. So actually, um, we made, a f the first projects we made were both in film. And so, should I actually say what the date is? It's kind of embarrassing. <laughs> but we, we made our first films in 1985 which was when we first started working together. So there are actually films right from the very beginning. And the first sort of major concert we did, we turned into what was then called a video dance, which we shot from all these different directions and edited it. And I also made an experimental video poem that year. Um, and yeah, so it was right from the beginning, actually. And that's, um, but it was sort of parallel to the, to the live work, though I will say, in 1986, we were commissioned by Karen said, don't say all these things about me. It makes you sound so old. But anyway, in 1986, we were commissioned by the New England Computer Arts Association to make the first ever computerized dance film. And we worked with um, some technology. I've forgotten. It was, it was, the it way, was a Fairlight. It was a Fairlight. It was fairlight a, synthesizer. It was the first ever use of a Fairlight synthesizer. And we worked with a video artist called Edith Battery in, in New York. Um, we created this work together. And we also worked with a uh, composer working with computers in Princeton, Paul Lansky. So we actually experimented right from the beginning. That whole idea of working with technology was right there right at the beginning. And then we still had 10 years of as a dancing company together after that, and then we did Taz Dance. So it was right there from the beginning. Richard's also always been a cinema buff. I, I didn't, when I met Richard, I didn't actually know the difference between Gary Cooper and Cary Grant. I know now. <laughs> but, but he was always really, really a cinema buff, so it was really, um, you know, he educated me, and we, we really care about cinema. So, and also, you know, I'm not gonna lie, I think dance is kind of a failed art form. It's cinema, it's anything you can do with movement, you can do in cinema. Wow. <laughs> okay, that's a big statement. <laughs> Just throw it out there. Go ahead, bite me on it. I'd be interested. <laughs> um, yeah, look, I think my family uh, used to love, they used to go to the National Film Theater in, in Sydney. Uh, and I was too young to go, and they were going to see the Bergman, the Kurosawa, and I was so jealous, and I'd get them to tell me everything about it when they came back. So, I, you know, I was really deeply into sort of cinema, cinema right from the beginning. Um, but I think we also felt like, as dancers, it was very important to try to have that experience and time to really live in the moment that you can get from theater and you know dance live while we can and so we really kept that going as, as long as we could but i think to me it was always part of the plan to get to film as soon as possible as well wow other questions, other questions? do we have questions uh -oh. just um say it out loud and we'll, we'll hear you yeah so, no, I might I walk around later Okay. This is a, a quick question about those last three films, you know, and I started thinking about the, the, the aesthetic difference between the subject of the, you know, the 20s constructivism and the actual, uh, you know, the, the narrative, etc., and the aesthetics of the way you, you know, framed all that, you know, and I found that quite a bit of a gap through it. Uh, and I, I mean, I felt that was sort of influenced a bit by this sort of AFTRS aesthetic that I've kind of evolved over the yeah. years. Yeah. 
But then I started thinking, uh, well, there was Jersey Tuplets who actually started the film school, and I'm kind of wondering if there's there's any anything to that thought. He was a Polish. Film, film director. He was the he was the original. So um, Jersey Jersey Tuplets was the original director of AFTRS, and yeah. the library is still named for him. And. Um, he actually came to La Trobe because his passport um, wasn't functioning and he couldn't get to AFTRS, so okay. he actually was at La Trobe. And when he was at La Trobe, I discovered, all the money came there. Any film that anyone wanted to make was made. Right. He, and then he went to... And then he went to yeah. AFTRS. That's yeah. so interesting. Look, it's a whole history that I don't know enough about or know a lot about. I think that... Um, yeah, I think sure. one of my kind of... I, I think that as the trilogy progresses, it gets more and more closely aligned with the actual constructivist aesthetics and modes. The, the, the last film um, is in five reels, and that structure is actually based on an, a, a, an idea written by Lilia Brick that she never got the opportunity to make, but she, she said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to shoot this film once, and then I'm going to cut it five different ways, and it's going to be five different films. And I sort of found that really interesting, that 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 kind of variation. So you'll see I'm using a lot of the same shots and a lot of the same um, kind of... It, I'm just evolving the set and so forth. So I'm, I'm jumping off of her aesthetic there. Really did a lot of research jumping off the constructivist aesthetic of um, in the dance, you know, looking at the kinds of... So S. Fuchsia met Sergei Eisenstein when they both worked in the theater workshop of Wiesewald Merhold, who was um, creating uh, constructivist performance works. And, and this, the dance style, the movement style that's in that film comes from watching videotapes of his biomechanics exercises. Sure, sure. I mean, I, you know, I think, of course, those, I appreciate all those connections and my comment about the gap is not like a criticism. It's kind of really talking about how things are technologically different now. How? Things are technologically different now, and a lot of the problem solving that you had to do that comes through some of the things that you've said is different to that the problem solving that was happening at that time. Yeah, you know, oh, so different. Them, one of them, especially the fact that as a woman, you are now able to stand in front of the thing at the end of it, in the <laughs> film, to sort of say those things. Uh, sort of, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I mean, but this gap, I think, is kind of really interesting because, you know, you've got all these different aesthetics. And I'm kind of just thinking about the personalities, etc., that have evolved through there, especially coming to a colonial place like Australia, and how that kind of gets transformed and how you kind of make, make that. Yeah, that, that's what I find interesting. So the, the gap. technology gap is, is certainly a, a really interesting one. It's one I could possibly speak to. The The cultural gap is m m so complicated and so layered and so, and has to do with so many things. I mean, I try, I allude to some of those things, yeah. but that last film I want to make a film about women, that's not so much, it's, that's me. And I am speculating, I'm speculating about and so rather than making it fiction, I've made it a speculative documentary. So what it's really a documentary of is my mm -hmm. hopes and my fears and my desires and my wonder about what, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I can only speculate about that and cultural gap. And that's partly connected to the fact that the archives don't have much documentation, not mm -hmm. much written. Um, well, that's the yeah. that's the, so the core course, point yeah. is that you know editors don't write down their thoughts. That's the first thing, and then um, women. So there's no there's no biography of S. V. Schul. Um There's biographies of Eisenstein. Many there's biographies of Bertolt, etc., etc. Those were are traditionally when 
men filmmakers died. It was the job of the women to collect their archive and get chapters from all of their friends and make these kind of memory books of these filmmakers. But Esri Show did not have a life, and neither did Svilova. So, <laughs> you know, the, they, they're, the cultural gaps are so many. I mean, it would just be really difficult to, to try to um, sort through all of them. But I think that the point you make, Anna, is really, really important one, which is the archives what's missing from the written document is women. And, and they didn't make noise the way the men did. They didn't, you know, go, here's my manifesto, I'm right, you're wrong. They didn't do any of that. They worked in a really different way. Um, so how, how do you think that difference is sort of expressed through the, the change in aesthetics from what was happening? You know, the changes in aesthetics? The difference how between is the, the aesthetics that were happening in the 20s to what's happening 100 years later? Uh, there's, there's too, there are too many variables for me to even approach that question. I mean, certain, you know, when we're talking about technology, we're talking about the, the end, you know, the f end of, cat of communism, we're talking about the Cold War, we're talking about, I mean, there's just so many things, many, 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 I couldn't name. I don't know, maybe we could throw that to the larger audience. Difference in aesthetics between the 1925 and 2025, what do you reckon? <laughs> I, I think, I think um, what I'll say is that we felt that the, the, the engine of creativity that was unleashed during the Russian Revolution um, was incredibly fundamental, sort of on the level like the Renaissance, and that that spurned a whole bunch of creativity which informed the whole of the 20th century and into the 21st century. And we wanted to go back to that sort of cauldron of activity and pay honour to it and be inspired by it. It's interesting you say that because one of my impulses after watching the films a few times was to go looking, you know. Um, I, you've co-edited, um, you know, a dossier in a journal, um, Apparatus, mm -hmm. which um, has many, like, uh, you know, a selection of essays on, on you know, Elisaveta, um, Esther and sort of some other women. Um, and, I, and in those kind of kitchens, you sort of see all these women around and you get that sense of creativity and also these other kind of women. And I started being interested in, in who they might be as well. I even went looking for Esther's film, what is it? Comms... <gasps> Which, which I saw you Comes had... Chief of Electrification. That's it, that's the, the one. The major Soviet hit of 1932. You haven't seen it? What? <laughs> it's a fantastic film. Well, and, and also what you'd selected from it, you know, yeah. kind of the, the, the sort of like, you know, sort of radiant sort of images of yeah. light globes. And, right, it's yeah, fantastic. Exactly. It's yeah. such, I'm, I'm yeah. not kidding, it's an extraordinary film. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. there is kind of like touches of that. Yeah. You've taken sort of like sort of images yeah. um, and, and it, it gave me a sort of, like a desire to find out more about, you know, kind of these women. That's very cool. I'm very happy just, about um, just Karen, a bit more on the strategy of our uh, speculative um, approach to documentary. Uh, mm. To presenting a, a mm. story and, mm. you know, biographies. Uh, have you, has, has it uh, caused any controversy uh, in certain circles? Like, Historians, or or do some people see it as a like a feminist provocation? On I your hope part? so. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say? I mean, in a bad way. <laughs> I will just say before Karen answers that question that we were terrified when we first showed Woman with an Editing Bench to the biographer of Zita Vertov and to some of those other people. It was really like these people had written a three-volume. <laughs> biographies and, and we worked very hard to try to really understand the period and get all of our references and our tones and, and, and but also have this different look but um, we were really thrilled that they were all super supportive and encouraging the archivists, the curators and everyone so that was really good. Well point. you also mentioned you know because I was impressed with your Vertov uh, you know, kind of wonderful performance, and you also burrowed into the history and read so much to just immerse yourself. In well, I mean, I felt it was a massive responsibility to play a person who was a real person, um, and also someone who had had a really tragic life, who was one of the greatest film artists ever, uh, but whose work was literally cut short and ended up dying of cancer, you know, very young and sort of miserable end. So. 
it felt to me like um, I it was a big responsibility to truly understand his character, which was very volatile and self-destructive and you know made a lot of mistakes, but also incredibly creative. But also in a film where we were trying to not make it about him, but to make it about the person who was left out. So it was a subtle, subtle game, and that I, I hope we did that. And I should hand back to you to answer on the question of uh, speculation. A really great question, thank you. I have to say that um, my work on speculative feminist film histories is part of a huge international groundswell of work. Um, there's, you know, if you wanted to know much more about women in early film, film up through 1930s, I'd recommend that you have a look at the online database from Columbia University, which is called the Women Film Pioneers Project, where there are over 300 biographies. Um, I and 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 the. I started attending conferences of these women who are looking into histories in round two, just before making the the, la the third of the trilogy, and you know I've learned so much from these women, the the historians, the you know the archive hounds, the, they're really drilling into it and saying, look, we know that they were there, mm. um, and yeah. my my approach to the the problem of of which comes up often in the Women Film Pioneers Project of like, well, we can't really say what she did or she probably deserved more credit than she got or this kind of thing, which comes up a lot. My approach is to bring together both um, historical research and creative practice research. And what I am guess I'm saying more or less colloquially is, look, I've been in editing rooms. I know what happens in the room. I know how responsible these women are for the shaping of these stories and experiences for audiences. I know what goes on in the set. If I know that there's all this distributed thinking going on in creative practice in the present, and I know that those women were there, and I know that it was all hands on deck no matter who had what role, and mostly the roles were totally undefined, can I use that knowledge of creative practice to ethically speculate about just how vital their thinking was, even if it wasn't written down or, you know, even verbally spoken. So that's my basic premise. And I guess the other part of the ethics of speculation for me is that I speak in the first person. It's m me. I, 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 how will I do this, I ask. I'm not pretending this is the story. And that's kind of one of the things that I really learned over the making of the three films, that you, if you want to speculate ethically, you need to name your frame. And this is, this is I'm the one who's, who's speaking here. And so if I got it wrong, yeah. that's just, just a quick right answer. If I might make a quick comment about it, I mean, you remind me a lot of what Anna Funder kind of says about in life and about her analysis of uh, George Orwell. I mean, well, she's she, amazing, so thank you. Well, she, she the, yeah, well, she, you know, it's almost like the same. You're repeating her, of course. What? what was that? Sorry, did you? Oh, that's it. The story's about Eileen, not George. Oh, you want to say something? Yeah. You, oh, well, that's what she says. Too. You sure? <laughs> Would someone else have a question back here? Hey, can I give a shout out while you were looking for questions to Kirsty Baird? Yeah. Kirsty, are you still here? Yeah. There you are. You would have seen Kirsty's name on about the first three films. I saw it there on the first three films. I was like, yeah, Kirsty, well done. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I just wanted to shout out to Kirsty for all, like, Kirsty was there when, in that transition from being a dancer to being a filmmaker, and uh, that, that was oh a great God. thing that you were there. And uh, <laughs> shout out to Sue as well for all the encouragement and, and you know, how great you've been in, in bringing us along in, in this creation of this trilogy, and then, yo, Sam, how well. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about physical TV? Because Physical TV is the umbrella yep. uh, production house. Um, extraordinary um, production house. So, so we... Literally house. <laughs> <laughs> so Karen and I um, yep. were dancing with other people in New York. Um, and we formed a company in New York called That Was Fast. 
uh, because we thought fast and we moved fast, and that was one of the reasons. Um, but um, when that was the company which we uh, described as having, I think I said before, a cinematic blend of text and dance action. Um, I won't go into all the history, but after a certain point, we came back to Australia and became artistic directors of Taz Dance, the state dance company of Tasmania, which we turned into a multimedia production house where we made five films and made a festival and books as well as live work. But after that period, we came back to Sydney and we were wondering whether we would go back to that as fast. Um, but we felt that we wanted to sort of move more into film and we wanted to uh, or screen altogether and we wanted to maybe create a new identity and we were developing a series for ABC television which was called the physical TV series so we created the physical TV company to create the physical TV series um, and uh, as it turned out it was really hard to get all of it up though some of the some of the films were made so Rubberman was one of the films in that series um, and you worked on that too. Christy worked on that, that's right. And No Surrender was the one that was uh, commissioned by ABC, which I directed um, with the wonderful indigenous artist and uh, consultant Bernadette Waylong. Um, and that was, that was commissioned and broadcast on ABC. So we didn't end up making the whole series, but we sort of made our own series. And then the company went on from there. So starting making dance films and then moving into what was called at one point new media, because we did a lot of experiments with technology, and some of them you see here, uh, and also then documentaries and dramas. So physical TV has made all those things, feature films, short films, um, yeah. And it's extraordinary the number of film festivals you've, um, these films are played at. We have, been breathtaking. we have been lucky enough, I, I have to do a count, but it's somewhere in to getting towards about 400 film festivals, and over a hundred awards and stuff like that. I don't that. know if yeah. there's anything that compares oh. with physical TV in Australia. <laughs> well, we're super proud of our latest film, which is Cut by Samuel Lucas. And Sam, can you come up here? No. <laughs> come on up, Sam. <laughs> Sam's latest film, Cut, no, is a really <laughs> wonderful film. Uh, it's actually screening this Saturday in Melbourne at the Capitol Theatre as part of the Melbourne Queer Film Festival. It was just on at GIF, and uh, it's going to be on at Canberra this week if anyone's in Canberra, but you're in Melbourne, so probably not. I want to say hi. Hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, we're really proud. You can see that, you know, Karen mentioned the Physical Family yeah, series, I saw that. which is a, mm. which actually started out um, with a commission from uh, SBS TV, because uh, we made uh, work when Sam was in Karen's tummy. And it's called Ears. What to Name Your Baby. And uh, we it had two live performances and then was made into a film for SBS. And that was actually a kind of a key turning point film in our careers in various ways. And after that, we made um, one when Sam was one called Sam and Pram. That was made at Taz Dance. And then we made Downtime Jazz with our uh, other offspring. And then... There was a sort of gap, and then Karen made a documentary called The Dancer from the Dance. So that's a whole sort of other thread that features our family. And Sam's going to direct the fifth and final uh, installment of the Physical Family series sometime in the next five years, right, Sam? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to complete the circle. Wow. Um, so yeah, there's a... Yeah, and we want to keep working on other cool projects. Mm -hmm. Any other questions yes. back there? Paul, have you got a question? Uh, I was just curious, how much um, like freedom or license do you have as an editor, like creativity, if you're not writing and directing as well? Obviously, in you, your guys' case, but as a director or as an editor. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, so the, it, it's incredibly variable, but it's always ex it's always very very responsible job. So in, in, in freedom, the kind of freedom and control paradigm isn't exactly the right one because people often sort of think, oh, the, the director makes all the decisions, the editor just executes them, or the director's out of the room and the editor's making it all up kind of thing. It's kind of neither of those. It isn't really freedom it's, or control. It's more like how much does my rhythmic propensity paint the shape of what 
finally emerges and how closely can I tune to the rhythmic mm, sense that the director is bringing into the room um, because what I really need to do is to channel both, both this, this is, you call it, might call it the desires of the director and the uh, the potentials of the movement that's on the screen. And and when I talk about movement, I I might be talking about movement of images and sound, which is you know obviously physical movement. But I'm also talking about movement of emotions and how those emotions are moving between characters on screen or between audience and character. And I'm also talking about movement of the overall story. Like, how does it flow? How does it unfold itself? How does it give answers or questions to, to the world? So freedom isn't exactly right. It's more like how much creativity, I would say. But um, I've been cutting Sam's films for a um, long time. And, um, and so how much freedom does the editor have, Sam? <laughs> I had a really wonderful experience of uh, childhood, uh, which was, has led me to be a bit of a tyrant in the directing sphere. Um, but one of the things that I think I had a really wonderful experience of was to see these two collaborate so uh, fundamentally and wonderfully uh, as a young person. I think that collaboration sort of attuned me to the idea that it's something that Karen has made a lot of films about, but also writes a lot about, uh, of uh, distributed cognition and distributed authorship. So I think when I look at a film as a director, I certainly don't look at it as though I'm the only author. Uh, and particularly with a, you know, a powerhouse editor behind me, I <laughs> often will heed their opinions quite strongly. And in fact, as I've been writing something recently, I've noticed myself almost writing with Karen's styles of editing in mind. Uh, with the knowledge that Karen will edit it, uh, I sort of allow myself certain freedoms or cut certain things. Uh, potentially, I will leave in a line that I think is a little iffy because I know if it really doesn't work, Karen can fix it. Um, or I will cut certain sequences, which I, from experience, know are never going to make it to the edit when Karen's in, uh, in there. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and I, the other thing I would just say is that there's a... It, it, it's often really unarticulated, which is mm. comes back to the problem of the archives. It's like there's not a kind of articulated decision. I want this. Let's do that kind of thing. It's much more. Uh, bleh, uh, bleh, uh, uh, <laughs> kind of kind of articulation that's going on and I just remember on our last film there was this moment that Sam and I were working on and we worked it and worked it and worked it and. and and he was so unhappy, and he was, and, and I, he, I was like, Sam, just tell me what you want. And he said, I can't tell you what I want. And I said, okay, well, tell me what you don't want. And he just lit into it. It's so boring, and so holes so standing, go back and forth. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. And then I could see, I could understand what he, what I could suddenly see what he was experiencing rhythmically, and that, was the key and so I said, okay, go, go have lunch. And I fixed it. <laughs> but I would also say that distributed authorship kind of extends beyond the editor as well. Like, I, uh, the, I think the first film that I've worked on with the three of you properly was this last one uh, where uh, Richard, my dad, was a in it, but also uh, the key producer on it. Uh, and certainly that authorship extends like beyond the editor and the director to like, the key producer who is shaping the fact that everything actually gets there and that it's actually good quality and that it actually, you know, I remember on that film particularly, there was this moment uh, where we were shooting it. We, I had a scene written that was supposed to be in a classroom and uh, Richard said, hey, let's go check out the Sydney Jewish Museum. And I was like, I don't want to put it in the Sydney Jewish Museum. It's too much to us. <laughs> um, and then we went and saw it, and I was like, oh my god, you're so right. Um, and I rewrote, like, two scenes to be in it, and they're some of the best scenes in the film. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, for me it's about team. It's distributed. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, some other questions? Yes. No. no. no more questions? Well, thank you. It's <laughs> been an honour and a pleasure to share thank it with you. you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. And you've got something new bubbling away. Apart from we, Sam's we, film, oh, one thirty yes. on Saturday. This Sam's film, and also um, Rebecca, she got two new films that are spinning around each other like a sun and a moon. Um, or uh, Two Sisters, maybe, be a better analogy. <laughs> uh, both directed by Karen and produced by me. Um, Breaking Plates, which is a 25-minute hyper-hybrid documentary. Um, if you thought you'd want to make a film about women was out there, wait for Breaking Plates. Because <laughs> it, it's uh, the challenge she set herself, set herself was to match that. Now, that film um, won 24 awards and was nominated for 16 other awards, which is just almost unheard of. So I don't know if we can do that, but certainly aesthetically, it is a huge um, piece of bravery. And also associated with that is a shorter dance film called Impossible Image, which is shooting around festivals at the moment. So they will be uh, coming out to a host, hopefully to a festival near you and other screening opportunities uh, next year. If the year. producer has anything to do with it. Yes, yes, yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I really encourage you to see Cut, which is, uh, um, was recently reviewed by Maggie Ball, saying it was unforgettable. Wow, well, congratulations. Pretty good. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.